Welcome everyone to another episode of Lunchtime with Luke. I want to talk about the concept of inevitability, specifically socio-political inevitability, and how it's fake. So you'll often hear people talking about the natural course of history. They'll talk about some kind of political event as being inevitable. They'll talk about a social change as being inevitable, or they'll talk about the right side of history or this kind of this kind of malarkey. Um, it's all a spook, and I want to explain not just why but why it always seems like there is a trend to history. Um, so I'm thinking about this today because today is 420, April the 20th, which is not just 420 day, it's also the birthday of uh, Adolf Hitler. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but it, uh, you know it doesn't matter if you don't, you've never heard of him. So uh, I was thinking about the Third Reich, and you may know that one of the most popular books during the Third Reich was Hitler's Mein Kampf, but I'm not going to talk about that. One of the other most uh, popular books, which people don't often know about, is a book called The Myth of the 20th Century by Alfred Rosenberg. And it, arguably it was number one. If not, it was number two behind Mein Kampf. But it was one of the most popular books. You've probably never heard of it, but, you know. Um, so what the book was about, it was really Rosenberg's, I guess, esoteric construal of the Third Reich or as history as being a conflict between uh, Judaic religion and uh, Indo-European religion and all this kind of stuff. It was a reinterpre reinterpretation of history on those lines. But I'm not so much interested in the content. But uh, in the introduction, at least, Rosenberg writes it as he is, like he's as giddy as a schoolgirl, because Rosenberg was a proponent of German National Socialism, and uh, at the period, he was writing the, during the Third Reich, and he was extremely happy to see the intellectual and cultural developments that caused the Third Reich to, you know, basically the, the National Socialist Party to win out over, you know, uh, Weimar Germany and all the other parties and stuff like that. And he presented that as a natural course of history. He has his reasoning, but he presented that as this all that's coming. We should be very happy that we are living in this time, uh, that history is finally coming to its summit, and the future only holds more greatness. We're going to continue in this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, that's a little funny for us because we know that things didn't work out how Rosenberg intended. You know, Germany lost the war, and you know what happened to Europe. So, um, in, in fact, even worse than that, you know, when the Allies took over... Um, Rosenberg himself actually was basically convicted in a show trial and was hanged for, you know, coordination with Nazi Germany, basically just for writing a book. But, you know, you, you can look it up yourself. Um, so Rosenberg was within 10 or so years, he would be dead uh, and Nazi Germany would be dead. And everything he had hoped for and had argued was inevitable, was go was basically dead. OK, or dead in the way that he understood it. Now, the thing about that is we look at that and we just see, oh, he's deluded or whatever, but we have the same kind of mythology and we've dealt with, like, there are every, every ideology convicts, convinces itself that it's inevitable. So one example, uh, Marxist socialism. No one nowadays still, well, unless you're like autistic, no one nowadays is a Marxist, okay? No one believes in that. I mean, there will be like post-Marxist uh, people who have like Marxist-influenced views, but no one believes in scientific socialism as a rationalization for a view of history, right? The accumulation of capital, all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, if you don't know, like Marx, what distinguished his socialism from the socialism of other people is that he wanted to basically convince people that it was an inevit it was a materialistic inevitability. It was going to happen. It is science. It's science to say that socialism is eventually going to win. No one believes that anymore. Uh, people believe that even, you know, 30 years ago or, well, I guess 40 years ago, whenever the Soviet Union was still not just alive but kicking. But um, over over time, just people have sort of realized, okay, that's not really going to work. And they move on to other theories of history. But we have the same delusions, right? So uh, in, uh, in the post-war era, of course, there's a famous book. There are really many famous books like this, but uh, there's the famous book by Francis Fukuyama, uh, The End of History, where he argues rationally argues in the same way that Rosenberg or Marx argued that liberal democracy is the summit 
of all civilization. It's the end of history. There's nothing that comes after it. It's just going to be more liberal democracy because we have perfected it. There's nothing, it can't get any better than it is now. Okay. Now people believe that even 10, even five years ago, but I think, I think even Fukuyama himself has realized, okay, that that's not true. I mean, you see, you see, of course, reactions against liberal democracy happening all over the world. I mean, well, even, you know, not just nationalist movements in America and Europe, but economically liberal, but culturally nationalist movements in Japan and India and stuff like this. So no one believes that anymore. So why do, why do people keep falling for this kind of delusion? And of course, there's still, there's, this mythology is basically in every ideology. I'll have people ask me about singularity. It's the same kind of stuff, all right? People always have, they take trends of history and they will take them to funny conclusions and then just assume that that is a law of history. So let's put it this way. So, you know, in any society, the ruling class, however you want to think of that, the opinion molding class got where it, it's going to be through basically happenstance victories. You know, they, they win some, they lose some, but they won enough to get where they are. And they want to present them ruling as a kind of inevitability. So Alfred Rosenberg, he wanted to prevent, present the fact that Nazi Germany ruled Germany as just inevitable. Okay, National socialism was inevitable. It seems sensible to him. In the same way that Marxists wanted to present socialism as an inevitability, in the same way that uh, Francis Fukuyama and other neoconservatives, uh, or neoconservative, neoliberals, whatever you want to call them, those nameless people that everyone hates, um, so he wanted pr to present that worldview as an inevitability. Because it would be hard for any of those people to believe that they rule by anything else other than inevitability or by just being right. Okay? So history is always presented you to you by the people, the opinion molding class in a way that makes it seem like their rulership is inevitable. Now, additionally, and I'm not just saying it's a kind of a conspiracy. Additionally, people don't want to believe in anything besides inevitability, besides fate, because, you know, let's say, uh, you know, let, let's say, uh, let's say World War II was a mistake. Okay. Let's say uh, the, the bad guys won. No one wants, really wants to believe, I mean, I know some people say that, but um, no one really wants to believe that the bad guys win in history. We want to believe that, you know, we're living in the best possible world. We don't want to think that, oh, you know, actually things would be better if, you know, the, the nationalists won in China and the communists lost or something like that. No one wants to believe that history makes mistakes because that definitely gives you the feeling of us, you know, something being incredibly wrong now. And additionally, you know, especially nowadays, we have this wig theory, this wig theory of history everywhere, where we are basically told lies about the past, like your perception of, you know, pre-industrial society is that everyone was sick, everyone had a miserable time, uh, you, it was just miserable, look at all these uh, economic indicators, that basically filter the world through these this viewpoint that makes everything look miserable. Therefore, you're better. Therefore, the things that have happened to bring us to this point must be good. Okay. So it all sort of conspires to create a view of history where the world we're living in is now inevitable. And not just that, but whatever direction we're moving into, we want to convince ourselves that that's good. If technology is taking, if social media is taking over the universe, and that seems like it's inevitable, we sure as heck want to convince ourselves that that is a good thing. It'd be scary if it would be something different. And most people who convince themselves that something is inevitable usually end up just embracing it. There are some exceptions. You know, we've talked about on, on the channel, right? So there's uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who basically argued that socialism was inevitable, but he also was anti-socialist. But he is an exception to, to most people. Most people want to believe that good things are going to happen and good things are going to inevitably happen. So the thing I want you to take away from this, I mean, there's more that can be said, but um, I want you to keep this in mind whenever someone says that something is inevitable, some kind of social change that they are endorsing is inevitable, some kind of political change is inevitable, because 
you know, any manner of things could be different. It wasn't inevitable that we survived the Cold War without a nuclear war. It was not inevitable that uh, the communists and the Anglo-Americans won World War II. It was not inevitable. No, no war is inevitable. You know, even, even if it's, it, no battle is inevitable. So I think for people to think that there is some kind of underlying trend, even when it's something abstract like, you know, technological singularity, um, once you run into a bump in that road, everything falls apart. And history, you know, if you go back to the 400s AD, people, the, the inevitable strand of history back then was Rome is collapsing, Attila is invading, this means that Jesus is going to come back in the year 500. That's what people, that was the, the Francis Fukuyama equivalent back then. Okay. So, and that sounds to us like total, totally stupid because it was totally stupid. And our views nowadays are totally stupid. You don't have the world figured out. There's no inevitable strand of history. And if there is, it's not going to last forever. Maybe it'll last for five years. So I, I don't know. That's not, this sounds maybe like a pessimistic video, but it's like, Hey man, you, you can make the world how you want it to be. You you have a say, dude. Uh, that sounds really lame. But anyway, so that's just the point I wanted to make. And I will see you guys in the next video.